Well, good morning. It's Wednesday, February 15th, 2017. And we're in the Senator Hearing Room for a weekly Board of Commissioner, Commissioners meeting. It's at 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. So welcome, everyone. We start our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance, so if you'd please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, we start with public comment, and for once we do have some public comment. Uh, uh, Tom Brawley would like to speak to us. Would you come over to one of those chairs and perhaps introduce yourself and then go ahead and start? One on the side, if you would. If I may, I'd like to pass this to you first. Fine. You can say why not. Fine. He said fine. This isn't about a land use case, right? This is not a land use Okay, case. all right, great. This but can. it is a land use I am a Marion County farmer, and I appreciate the way you started this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance and allowing me to come first, both of those. I farm in the middle of your map that I've given you, just to give you an idea where that is. From the center of the map is 15 miles to Salem, 15 miles to Albany, 15 miles to Staten. So we're in South Marion County. We have a safety issue, and it's due to the traffic on the roads of Winter Creek, which starts from the center of your map and goes left, west, and also Parish Gap Road, which goes north-south, somewhat in the middle of your map. Both these roads are hilly and they're curvy. And the sight distance on these roads is very short. Farmers, as you know, need, act, need these roads to, to access our, our fields and to run farm to market. The access of the fields is the concern because we run wider and wider equipment down these roads and the traffic is getting heavier and heavier on these roads. It also, the speed is increasing and the numbers of traffic of, uh, units are increasing. And I think that in my opinion that we've reached a maximum load on that road for a secondary road. So I ask you to consider <clears throat> why are we doing this? There's two reasons that I can see. One of them is that it's being used as a bypass. They're bypassing the city of Jefferson and using our roads to, to, to uh, swing around. Another large effect, if you'll look at the yellow blocks on those maps, there have been permitted hundreds of subdivisions in our area. Smaller parcels, <clears throat> which contain each of those, <laughs> generally contain two or three cars, a couple of dogs, some shotguns, and probably a mother-in-law. <laughs> so I ask you to look at and question yourselves, under what obligation are you, as county commissioners and the planning department, obligated to sub further subdivide those? They were set up as a buffer or, and as an opportunity for people to have small farms. A small farm, in my opinion, would be 10 or 20 acres. And these have been permitted to subdivide down to two acres, which has heavily increased our traffic. I ask you to further consider whether it's your obligation to, to the people who want to subdivide or your obligation to we who are farming larger parcels and have the safety issues 
to go. I've talked to uh, almost all the farmers along both roads and they have deep concerns also. So if you have any questions about it, I'd be glad to answer, but I ask you to heavily consider any further subdivisions. All right, any questions? So I just want to clarify, this is not testimony with regard to the land use hearing that we're having later on today, is that correct? Does that it is relate? correct, this, I'm an individual who's come in with concerns, safety uh, concerns. All right, that has nothing to do with the land use hearing that we're no, doing. No, I, I actually hearing. didn't know you were having a okay. land use hearing. Okay, all right, hearing. great. We just wanted to clarify that, because there's, it's been a, <laughs> all right, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowling. All right, thank Good you. Good to see you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Writing something down, so let's uh, we'll move on. We do have some presentations, actually three. One that one that isn't listed, but we're going to happily work in. But the first one is a uh, Energy Trust of Oregon presentation of an incentive check, which sounds good for Marion County Health Building. Colleen Coons Chafin, <coughs> Angel Swanson, Energy <coughs> Trust of Oregon. So I don't know who that is, but Colleen, would you lead us on? Yes, sir. Good morning. morning, Colleen Coons, Chapin's Business Services Director. Angel, this is Angel Swanson from Energy Trust of Oregon. Okay. Hello. And Larry Tilford, my facilities manager, who to whom I give all the credit for receiving this money. I tell you, there's such a, a continued stress of getting stewardship dollars to make sure we're doing the right things. And part of that is the money we're going to see today. So from the Energy Trust of Oregon, for the health building project and for pre-planning for other projects that are coming up. We're presenting you with one check today for $434,000. Oh, that's In a real In total, there'll be $464,000 we've already received for pre-planning for the next projects. And again, all credit goes to Larry and Angel for making this work. So I want them to take the stand. I'm gonna get out of the way. Thank you. Larry, sure. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. We were fortunate enough to begin this process back in December of 2014 when we started considering the development and remediation of the health building. And we were looking at energy saving uh, options within that scope of work that included uh, replacing those windows that were single pane with double pane windows for higher uh, energy efficiency, replacing the HVAC system and replacing the lighting systems both added to that uh, scope of work and uh, additional savings. So we just completed, as you know, the health building, and uh, Angel, you wanna take it? Sure. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with Marion County on this project, and I'm part of the existing buildings program. We have a new buildings program. My colleague also works with Larry on some of those other major renovations, and this is our, our goal is to stretch your money so that you can save more energy and help Energy Trust achieve the goals, as well as Marion County achieving their goals. So. On behalf of Energy Trust of Oregon, I'll present this check for three, I'm sorry, $434,774.25 to the County of, of Maine. Fantastic, thank you. So we, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Jolene, did you wanna, would you hold that up again for Jolene to come over and record this moment? Can we present oh. it to you all? Oh, fine. That'd be great. You even have to go up front. Okay, well, yes, go ahead. I'll hold it first and I'll ask you questions. Okay. <laughs> Better hold it tightly. All right, ready? One, two, three. Is it one more? One, two, three. Before you go, so is there a, off the top of your head some particular project that qualifies for this or something that we did exceptional that you're trying to recognize? Tell me a little more about it. 
Well, I have to give kudos to Larry and his team because these projects are big and complicated and each of the measures need to be assessed as in their own merit. And so we need to pull out information from lots of other pieces of information and these kind of contracts. And I think that Larry and his team have done a really great job of providing the information so that we can be clear about the savings that are being generated and the work that's being done. And, and um, so in terms of kinds of projects, we do all sorts of projects. Anything that saves energy, anyone in this room, if you have PGE, Pacific Power, Northwest Natural Gas, Cascade Natural Gas, or Avista Natural Gas, we can provide incentives if you take steps to save energy in your own businesses, in the county level, city, state, everything. I'm, so. I'm just talking out loud, but give me an example, you or Larry, of, of something that we did that really saved energy. Do you want to use it? Anything jumps out at you? The, the well, lights are great. Lights are an amazing uh, way to save energy. So retrofitting any incandescents or any older fluorescents or uh, with, um, with an LED you're going to be saving a ton. Of, it's almost like your building will run for free uh, with LEDs. I mean, the technology is advancing every month. Um, over the last few years, it's been amazing. So we've had customers who have uh, spec'd out a project, ready to go, and then a couple months later, they'll get an updated technology and they'll save even more energy. So um, it's just a real, lighting is excellent. Um, HVAC, if you want to retrofit your HVAC, add VFDs to your, um, most operations, you'll save energy. So. Yeah, the, the lighting that we replaced at the court at the uh, health building was the old T12, T12 fluorescent fixtures and we've converted them all to LED. So not only do we have energy savings, but we have light fixtures that will last 10 years or more as opposed to the, uh, the old fluorescent style. Um, HVAC system saved a lot of energy because we're not running hot water through a closed loop in the building all the time anymore. And the windows, of course, being single pane and now being double pane, that's a tremendous savings. We're not allowing all the heat to go right out of the building like we were before. And the comfort for the folks working in these offices. And the comfort is a huge aspect. We um, haven't come up with a way to quantify how happy people are yet, but it's okay, because all the other factors really make it, make it work out. Angel, thank you. I'm suddenly feeling nervous in this two-year-old uh, <laughs> obsolete <laughs> technology, but we'll keep moving along. Anybody else have a question, comment? We're staying, we'll move on to the next item for CCTV's sake, and we have a special presentation of somebody that I've got to know since being a commissioner that's involved in so many wonderful things for Marion County, a constant volunteer, and you have it written up, so commissioner. So we wanna invite Bob Royer to come up. Thank you for being here this morning, Bob. So uh, Bob, I became the chair of the Public Safety Coordinating Council, I think it was a couple years ago, three years ago when Commissioner Milne left uh, Marion County, and Bob was the vice chair of that, but he has been on the Public Safety Coordinating Council since it began in 1996, and has served all of these many years. He's also been on our Marion County Budget Committee, Compensation Board, and the Courthouse Square Task Force. Uh, the staff said that there were so many committees that he volunteered for that they couldn't fit them all on the plaque. So they fit as many as they could, and uh, we just want to express to you, thank you so much for your service, especially the Public Safety Coordinating Council. You've just been a stalwart member and I always appreciate the perspectives that you offered and uh, the opportunities that you gave us to think differently about things and that was really great. And Sam, can you read the, uh, the plaque? Well, Bob Royer, in recognition and sincere appreciation of 25 years of dedicated and committed volunteer service to the people of Marion County from 1992 to 2017 from the Marion County Board of Commissioners. So we'll take this. And I forgot to mention he was also a recipient of the Rex Hartley Award for volunteering. So. Sure, uh, time flies when you're having fun. Thanks a bunch, and I appreciate the opportunity that Marion County has provided me over a few few years. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, our next item of business is uh, going to be led by Commissioner Carlson. It's a Midwell Homeless Initiative final report. So, when you're ready, go ahead, Commissioner. I need to figure out how we change these slides before I get into the, yay, all right. I know how to do it, okay. So good morning, commissioners, uh, and everyone who's in the room. I'm Janet Carlson, Marion County Commissioner, and I'll let Laura introduce herself. I'm Laura Walker. I'm a project coordinator with the City of Salem, and I've been working on the Homeless Initiative. So we did this presentation for the City of Salem on Monday evening, and we're going out to all of the various jurisdictions, nonprofits, anyone who will have us to be able to describe what we spent the last year doing. Uh, and the topic is the Mid Willamette Homeless Initiative. So I probably don't need to tell you that uh, there's a crisis around homelessness uh, in the Salem area, throughout Marion County, in the state of Oregon, and across the nation. Uh, people see the homeless. Uh, camped out on sidewalks, standing on street corners, uh, sheltered in walkways. Uh, when we went out uh, to all of Salem's neighborhood associations and Kaiser's over for the Public Safety Council when we did those public safety forums and across the county, we heard about homelessness. We, every meeting in Salem, we heard about people camping by streams, camping out in city parks. Uh, we've seen people in the Rite Aid parking lot and, uh, and heard about people camping there. Uh, and the waiting list, and this was brought out at the uh, uh, giving people a second chance breakfast that we had this year in October where we focused on housing. Uh, for Salem Housing Authority, it has 10,000 families on the waiting list. It takes them two to three years to actually get into housing in Salem. So it's a major problem. The second question then to ask, first question being, is homelessness a problem? The second question is, who are the homeless, or as we say, people experiencing homelessness. And we know that in addition to those that we see on the street, there are many, many people that we don't see who are homeless, who are living in cars, who are doubled up in other people's homes. We have veterans who are homeless, families, women with children. Uh, we have Jane Downing talk about domestic violence and people fleeing that situation and becoming homeless and needing to go into shelter. We had presentations on seniors being homeless. Uh, runaway and homeless youth, a whole different category of, of homelessness. In some instances, they're running from a situation at home. Uh, and then, of course, the mentally ill and the chronically homeless, which are those that often we see uh, that are more visible. So then the next question is, how many people are homeless in our community? And the answer is, we don't really know. That's one of our big goals to get started on first, is to do a better job of collecting data. And let me tell you, there are a lot of dedicated people that collect data around this, so I'm not trying to say that uh, the people that are working on it aren't doing a good job, but the, but the problem that we have uh, and I actually did this count when I was a consultant back in the 90s, and they didn't do the point in time count. So what I did was I went and contacted all of the shelters, and we had many more shelters at that time, and asked them to tell me on, on any given night how many people were in their shelter, and then we took all of those numbers together. Now they do a point in time count, which is a one day snapshot that not only does the shelter count, but also looks out and they actually walk the streets and count people and they get massive numbers of volunteers that they train to be able to do that. But of course that's a one day snapshot and it depends on how many people are out on the streets or in a shelter that night. It doesn't count those people who are invisible that we can't see. Um, and uh, oftentimes, we have so many programs working on homelessness that, and they each have their own databases that uh, we get duplicated counts. It's very difficult for us to know exactly how many people are homeless. 
From the data that we do count, uh, there's 1,660 <coughs> homeless people in Marion County on any given day, and we think that that's vastly undercounted. Of that number, 116 are, are homeless veterans. Uh, Salem-Kaiser School District does a count of homeless families. They actually have a homeless outreach program. And in 2015-16, they counted 1,397 homeless children and I think families. Um, so if you think Salem-Kaiser is our very large school district, but we have a number of other school districts in Marion County, and this 1660 is Marion and Polk, and they have a lot of school districts, you start to see how that 1,660 really is not uh, the, uh, I, it's a conservative count. It's not an accurate count of, of how many homeless people we have in this area. Prison reentry, we put that number in, and you're familiar with that. We have about 600 a year, 500 to 600 that come out of prison. About half of them are homelessness, we know from our jail surveys. And then Jane gave us the range 200 to 500 each year that are victims of domestic violence that are fleeing a situation. So that's just a sampling of the numbers that we get, and you put all those together, and you get kind of a sense about that it's a big problem, but you still don't have accurate numbers. We know that we have a huge lack of housing capacity, and that should say Section 8 vouchers up there, but two to three years for Salem Housing Authority, a year, uh, more than a year for public housing. And then Marion County's Housing Authority is a little bit better, one to two years. But we have, we know, and a big part of this problem, as we talked about in the task force, has the, the dynamic has been that many people who owned their own home during the recession lost their homes because they lost jobs and lost income and then went into bankruptcy. So they moved into rental housing. Rental housing then as people who have more means because those folks then when the recession lifted gained, you know, if it was a two income family, then they might gain one income or two incomes back, can afford rents of much higher than what someone who is low income living on disability or social security can afford. And so we have, it just kind of squeezed everything out. We have all these vacant homes that are still going through bankruptcy that people who went through bankruptcy can't get good credit so they can't move back into. And then the rentals have kind of adjusted themselves upward to respond to the ability of people to pay higher rents. So we have stories of people, and you've heard them at the Housing Authority meeting with vouchers that are out there two, three, four months and they can't find an affordable rental unit to be able to use their voucher because it's based on income. So because of all of these dynamics, uh, we pulled together what, what we're calling a call to action, the Mid-Willamette Homeless Initiative. We as commissioners approved a charter last January, a year ago January, uh, and identical charters were passed in Polk <coughs> County, City of Kaiser, and City of Salem. Each jurisdiction appointed five people to the task force, so we had a task force of 20. Uh, the people that were appointed from Marion County were myself, who served as one of the co-chairs, Bruce Bailey from the Union Gospel Mission, Gladys Blum from Gladys Blum Real Estate, Sheriff Jason Myers, and John Reeves, who's the Executive Director of the Community Action Agency. We also had represented uh, uh, property managers, we had a Kaiser City Councilor, uh, we had uh, a Councilor and the Mayor of Salem, and the Mayor of Kaiser, I didn't mention Kathy, Ron Hayes from uh, Department of Mission and Advancement, Judge David Leith, who served in uh, his personal capacity, we put that on the stationery and he said that every time he introduced himself, uh, Chief uh, Jerry Moore from uh, City of Salem Police Department, and then uh, we had Jennifer Wheeler from Polk County, Sheriff Mark Garten, uh, Steve Bob from the tribe, the Grand Ronde tribe, Heidi McKay from the West Salem Business Association, and Irma Oliveras from the Salem-Kaiser School District who was appointed, uh, who was nominated by uh, Christy Perry and appointed by Polk County. So all of those people served and we met pretty much once a month for an entire year and had presentations on all of these different topics that we're talking about. About second or third month, the group said we want to break into subcommittees. So we had eight subcommittees and you can see the names, I won't read them to you up there. Each of those subcommittees had task force members on them uh, as well as people who we called technical experts who came in from different programs and provided information. Anyone could participate on those. Our staff in Marion County spent an enormous amount of time uh, providing meeting space, recordings, noticing the meetings, providing paperwork, uh, photocopies, those types of things so that those groups could uh, come together and, and provide their expertise. 
In addition to all of uh, the, and I didn't mention we had uh, public comment at each of our meetings as well. So in addition to the subcommittee work, the public comment, the task force meetings, um, we also had uh, community forums that John Reeves from Community Action was involved with uh, in helping put together. There was actually a committee you can see that's called uh, Focus Groups Coalition Coordination. Uh, and they provided uh, a report to the task force. Let me get, this is, writing's too small for me to read. All right. So they had a survey of runaway and homeless youth. They had 30 surveys uh, for runaway and homeless youth and in interviews. And uh, for adults, they, did they got 123 surveys and in interviews. And of those 123, 57 represented individuals or groups of people who were homeless or recently homeless. So they uh, provided a lot of information about, the, about themselves, what their experience was, uh, what, help, what types of help they needed. Uh, the information's been compiled in a report that we can provide for you. And it's on the, we have a website that Marion County is hosting as well. Uh, the remainder of folks were involved in agencies that helped the homeless. And the top five issues that they identified that needed to be addressed was one, lack of housing and shelter, and particularly a lack of permanent supportive housing, two, mental health issues, three, employment and job assistance, four, basic needs including food, bathroom, showers, laundry, transportation and clothing, and five, addiction and mental health treatment services. So we had a very broad base of uh, participation in the initiative. And after hours and hours of research, deliberations, presentations, public comment, community forums, uh, we came up with a uh, strategic plan. And so what did we learn in developing that strategic plan? Well, first of all, we learned, and we probably knew this going into it, that homelessness is a very complex issue, that there's not a silver bullet that says if you do this one thing, you're going to solve the problem for homelessness. Uh, that works, what works for one population is obviously not going to work for another one. So what works for runaway and homeless youth is not going to work for domestic violence, is not going to work for veterans. So you have to have multiple strategies to address this diversity of problems. And also you need to look at the short term, the medium term, and the long term. And I'm a firm believer in that certainly we want to have warming centers and we want to have uh, basic needs met. But if we're just making people experiencing homelessness more comfortable in their homelessness without actually doing something about the root cause and helping them move into permanent housing, then I don't think we're really doing our job in terms of trying to figure out what the solutions are. So in front of you, you have the strategic plan. Uh, it's 27 pages of recommendations that are just what I described about multiple populations, very diverse. Uh, they range from uh, uh, affordable housing recommendations and uh, credit repair and those types of things to looking at city county regulations to shelter and uh, and housing on the affordable residences one of the things that's already occurred is that Mountain West investment applied for a grant from Oregon housing and community services and got five million dollars and they are committed to uh, develop, I think, several hundred housing, affordable housing units in this area within the next couple of years. With regard to city-county regulations, both Kaiser and Salem are working on accessory dwelling units and allowing those, and I know we've had the discussion here in Marion County uh, where it's allowed in the urban areas, and then, of course, there's legislation that I've been working on that got endorsed by Association of Oregon Counties on Monday, thankfully, and we're working with Representative Clem to move those two bills forward to allow us to uh, look at accessory dwelling units as in the rural areas. Again, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve the problem, but it's another tool in the toolbox. Uh, with regard to transitional housing and shelter, uh, Marion County has been working on a reentry housing facility. There's $1.2 million in Section 32 funds that a group of us has been uh, putting together a waiver letter, uh, just met with the sheriff and under sheriff to make sure that we had everything that they wanted in that letter. And uh, I know, uh, Commissioner Brentano, you've signed off on it as uh, chair of the Housing Authority. I think we're waiting for some feedback from HUD just to make sure that, again, we've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed before we send that in. But fingers crossed we would have a facility for uh, 12 people at a time for transitional housing out on the jail campus. Uh, Union Gospel Mission is uh, putting together a capital campaign to expand, to move actually, and expand their men's shelter, which is badly needed. I think anytime we're downtown in Salem, we can see the numbers of people that can't get into that shelter. 
And then of course we want to acknowledge the city of Salem opening up their Delon space for warming centers during the past cold spell uh, to really expand that space and, all, and the Department of Energy building where they worked with uh, the church that was next door to be able to uh, provide additional warming for people that were out, would have been out in the cold. Uh, harm reduction is another thing we talked about around public safety, and again, I'm just highlighting a few things. Uh, law enforcement assisted diversion, Paige Clarkson, uh, Deputy District Attorney, is leading a work group on that. Uh, the District Attorney, and we've heard about this in our Community Corrections Board, has already implemented a new way to approach people in what we call these quality of life crimes where people are downtown and they're not committing crimes where there's, uh, vic where there's physical harm to someone, but uh, things like urinating in public and trespassing and those types of things that are more related to addiction um, and homelessness combined. And so the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program is out of Seattle and it's designed to divert people with mental illness and addictions from emergency rooms and from our jail and uh, actually push them towards treatment. So we're right now working with the Sheriff's Office to provide a grant so that we can get planning on that uh, and get the, the program set up. And then the last example that we had here on panhandling for public safety, uh, there are laws that allow people the opportunity to panhandle. So it's, we, we can't, I know some people have suggested that they want to outlaw panhandling and I think that approach was suggested by City of Salem and, and uh, they were informed that that was not possible. But there is a really great program in Salt Lake City and we had the uh, uh, implementers of that program on the phone in one of our subcommittee meetings about promoting giving cash to nonprofits that help the homeless rather than handing cash to the panhandlers because as we know many times, and it's kind of hard to tell, but there are a lot of people out there panhandling that aren't necessarily homeless. They're part of a group that makes quite a bit of money standing on street corners and, and having those signs in front. And so the idea is that if we contribute to nonprofits as a community, uh, rather than handing cash to folks that if the source dries up, people will be less likely to stand on the street corners. What they do in Salt Lake City is they also have a web-based opportunity for people to contribute, and they have parking meters downtown where it says make the real change, and then you put the change in the parking meters, and that it's not a lot of money, but it's symbolic, and it gets collected and goes to the, to the nonprofits that, that help the homeless in Salt Lake City. So City of Salem is interested in doing that. It would take some uh, public education uh, communications uh, and then setting up the meters and the website. Special populations, and I won't read you all of these, but we have recommendations for each of the special populations that I talked about earlier in the strategic plan. And so where we're heading next, because uh, one of the things that we talked about as a task force is that no one on the task force, when we went around the table on the first meeting and said, what do you want from this task force? I think the common theme was, we don't want to study something and then just have a study that sits on a shelf. We need to be doing something. And so it's taken us a year, and we promised everyone that we wouldn't meet for longer than a year to uh, get the recommendations together with all of the uh, uh, inclusion that we had. But uh, we do need to have a new collaborative structure that we're moving to, and we're calling this pivoting to, to implementation. So we have just had a meeting yesterday, in fact, where we talked with the mid uh, Willamette Valley Council of Governments, Nancy Boyer, who is the interim director back uh, serving in that role, um, about the possibility of a position, a project manager being housed at the COG. Um, this was suggested by Mayor Kathy Clark, and Mayor Chuck Bennett jumped on the idea and said he thought it was a great idea as well. Uh, what, one of the pieces is that if any one of the entities, so Salem had suggested that perhaps that initially, Chuck had said, well, maybe we could just have that position in, in Salem. But uh, then it becomes Salem's position as opposed to the region's position, and COG is a regional organization. And uh, Kathy was really emphatic that she wanted it to go to Switzerland. She didn't want it to go to any one particular uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so we have, we have actually uh, talked with each of the jurisdictions, including Marion County, about setting aside some funds so that we could jumpstart this project manager position over at the COG. Uh, there are some meetings in March, an executive committee meeting and a board meeting that's going to happen in March where this proposal is going to be brought forward. Uh, the 
project manager would report to uh, an executive team, and these would be the executive directors and uh, representatives from the government jurisdictions that would help guide the process. The concept is that that team wouldn't meet all that often. It wouldn't be monthly meetings because we've done the planning. It would be a team that would actually oversee the implementation. So, for example, the housing authority directors, the community action director, the union gospel mission director, those people would be key in helping guide that work because they're the ones that are providing those services. Uh, there would also be a team that the project manager would pull together of uh, uh, what they're calling middle managers or uh, uh, program managers because that is, that is the level where program implementation occurs and then if that group get stuck and they need something with regard to budget or policy or whatever, then the executive team gets called on. It's much like the structure we have with the reentry initiative where we have a reentry council and then underneath it we have a design team where those middle managers meet and talk about employment issues or uh, housing issues or the other things that we deal with with reentry. And then uh, the other concept that was talked about is pulling together the line staff so that, because many of the recommendations, particularly around social services, were not around adding new programs, but they were simply around coordinating better the programs that we have, making people that are working with the homeless more aware of programs that we have, for example, at Inside and the workforce development programs, so that they know about that programs and have access to them and understand how to get their folks into those programs. Um, so, uh, so the advisory committee structure really would be on three levels. Uh, we want to make sure that there are periodic reports to the participating organizations so people are kept aware of what's going on. Uh, and the, there will ultimately be shared ownership through a memorandum of collaboration that all of us will be asked to sign once that project manager is in place and that language gets crafted. So I will turn it over to Laura to see if she's got anything to add or maybe just talk briefly about your experience with the task force. So we've been working on this since, well, officially since February of last year, and there have been several meetings. I've attended several of the subcommittee meetings. There's been a lot of really good discussion and questions. Um, we've looked at getting more information around the um, panhandling issue and also around a uh, one-stop resource center, um, including a sobering station and or detox, which City of Salem is very interested in moving forward on. Um, and I think it's been a really good learning experience for everyone involved. The task force is made up of so many diverse groups, um, including the nonprofits and the business world and also the elected officials that I think that we have all of the players on the team uh, to move this forward, so. And at our final meeting, and uh, Kaiser graciously allowed us to use their council chambers for our meetings, uh, we honored all of the members of the task force that had served, uh, and also we honored our, the staff that work, the loan staff that worked so hard, uh, Laura, and also Hitesh Parekh and Lisa Trowernick from our office spent a lot of time and a lot of energy making this possible. So I want to make sure that we acknowledge them. Also, Anna Peterson came on Monday night to the uh, council meeting, and we were able to give her her certificate and, and recognize her at that meeting. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about the initiative or where we're heading in the future. If I may, please. Th thank you, Commissioner and Laura. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, just what we would be looking for in the future from reports back to the board for, for the investment of your time and, and this uh, future uh, position that is being, uh, you know, propped up. What will we be seeing and how often? So the, I think that remains to be seen because we are still conceptualizing around the project manager. It was interesting when we had that discussion on, at the last meeting, uh, there are people on the task force that felt really concerned that they, once the task force was done, they wouldn't be in the information loop. We have a, a 200 plus person email list. That doesn't include the task force members. These were just our interested persons list. And we will make that email list available to COG and, and to the project manager to send out information on a periodic basis. Uh, we would have, you know, we would anticipate that there might be presentations like this that would come from time to time. I think Chuck Bennett, uh, Mayor Bennett, uh, was very concerned, however, when that discussion occurred that the person who's the project manager spends most of his or her time actually implementing 
and not doing what he called bureaucratic reports. <laughs> so I think there has to be a balance there in terms of keeping the community informed. I think also there's a responsibility really of each of the government jurisdictions. We are working on what, we're, what uh, in Salt Lake City, when I was down at that conference, I actually met with a couple uh, policy analysts that are working, you know, they've received a lot of national attention on their homeless initiative in Salt Lake, at Salt Lake County actually. They have a mayor and a, and a 16 member council for their county, it's an interesting, structure and uh, and they talked about uh, now I've lost my train of thought where, where, where was I going with that yeah so reporting versus uh, bureaucracy right and now I've, I've completely lost my train of thought I'm sorry I'll, it'll come back <laughs> okay you're pretty intimidating with a new <laughs> <laughs> with a new look yeah yeah <laughs> shoot I'm sorry Something, uh, it was something that they, that they, oh, the money right. map, that's what I was talking about. So they talked about how they did a money map in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County. And the money map identified where the dollars came from for addressing homelessness. And the lion's share of the dollars came from Salt Lake County when they actually put it together. And I think when we put our money, and they didn't do public safety, interestingly, they're adding public safety now, but because it's so controversial in the community that we're using a public safety approach for homelessness that we're arresting people that are homeless and jailing people that are homeless, they didn't include the jail costs and the police costs and those types of things where there are costs. They just talked about the services and uh, they, our housing authority is not officially part of our county, but we serve as the board of that housing authority, so that would be part of it. My guess is, we haven't done our map, that if we put Salem and Marion County together, we probably are the lion's share of the dollars that go into homelessness. So there is an obligation, really, on our part, I think, to help continue to spread that word because it's the project manager, one person, is not going to implement a 27-page plan. That person's going to be the hub of a spoke of many wheel, you know, uh, many spokes on a wheel, and everybody working together is going to make this work. So it's the organizations that are already doing the work that are going to have to step up and do things maybe a little bit differently or work together with another organization a little bit differently to be able to make a difference. And the last thing I'd want to say on that is that we've emphasized too that there's a lot of good work going on on homelessness every single day here. I mean, we know our housing authority is trying to get those vouchers out and working with landlords and helping people that wouldn't have a home otherwise live in the housing that we provide in Mount Angel and Woodburn and all around the county. The same thing happens in the city of Salem. Thousands of people are housed in the city of Salem every day and programs by the Housing Authority. And so we're not trying to minimize the work that's going on. It's just that we can see it's not enough. And if we don't step up to the next level and try to figure out what we can do together with, the, with probably some additional resources to be able to address the problem, we're just going to continue to see this, um, what, we, what we're seeing right now. Thanks for uh, accommodating my brain warp there. <laughs> Senior moment, sorry. Well, first of all, I know when you take on a project, you get to the bottom of it, and I thank you very much for your time and, and what I really sense is your concern. So don't be offended <laughs> when I don't know what we're signing on for, and, and I'll need a better picture of, of the real dollars and commitment in the long term that you're looking for. So there's a lot of vagueness, and I know you can't even have the answer because it's not in focus. But that's what I'll be looking for. And then it's so minor, but I've said this before. I'm always concerned about setting up programs that attract others to come into the area. Did you even have those discussions? Does anybody else worry about that? But I don't want to become the mecca for homelessness. Right. You know, I want to take care of our own, but not expand it. Right. Well, I think... I mean, one thing is that in order to serve the people that are already here, we have to do some things better, differently, you know, move stronger, faster, that kind of a thing. Uh, I, the, the main discussions that we had that I think probably were controversial about it, uh, there was there was a group from Salem that went down and looked at uh, the tent camps down in Eugene, and we had Pat Farr, Commissioner Farr, who actually presented at one of our meetings and showed slides about that. I went on the uh, housing tour during the Association of Oregon Counties Conference, and I think that was after the group from Salem had gone down to take a look at it. And I think all of us came back, police chief, city of Salem folks, myself, 
and others really not feeling like the tent camps were something that really was appropriate for this area. However, I think there's a lot of interest in tiny houses. Uh, I know that I, when we talk with Ron Hayes, there's an interest on their part, and they're talking to people that, some of the people that actually build those. I don't know if you've seen tiny houses, but there, some of them are on wheels, some of them are actually on a, you know, sitting on the ground. Uh, some of them have bathrooms, some of them don't. Uh, and so th there's a lot to be looked at in terms of the tiny house development. There is an organization in Salem uh, and a, a woman uh, from, who's actually a professor at Willamette who's involved with the group uh, came and spoke with me about it. Uh, they've submitted a proposal to the City of Salem. I think the City of Salem is looking for a little bit more due diligence on their part before they would endorse that. Uh, and the other thing that's really different about Eugene area, this was on county property. They had extra county property that used to be a trailer park. I mean, ideal land, it was their public works lot, and they just gave it for a dollar to the, you know, leased it for a dollar uh, to the city and then set up these tent camps. We don't have, I mean, we've taken a look at our property that we have when we had the assessor's maps. We have little easements here and there. You know, we don't have large parcels of property other than the front of the health department or the back lot of the public works department where even this would be possible. And so that was one of the questions that she had for me was, you know, do we have land like they have in Eugene? And the answer was no, and I think the city has given them the same, same answer, so now they're gonna have to look for private land and people willing to do that, which makes it more difficult. But uh, I think the second piece is uh, of the discussion, and again, I've, that Portland has had numerous people that have come in that, particularly for the camping, I think, and that we saw that that was not a good decision, I think they agreed it was not a good decision and they ended it, but we, we have heard anecdotally, and maybe Laura can speak more to this, that there have been some people from Portland that have been sent down to Salem, right, because they couldn't accommodate them, is that, I don't want to misspeak. Um, there was an article that came out, I guess it was a few months ago, where there was uh, bus passes being given by some of the social service agencies in Portland to bring folks down to Salem because they didn't have the services in Portland. And the idea was that the folks that they were sending here would have a support network, whether it be family and or friends in the area that would help to support these folks. And they were supposed to check in on these individuals, um, which it sound like was not happening. I'm not 100% sure if that's accurate, but that was the way that the, the story was written. So um, we have seen an influx in the number of visual homeless, as Commissioner was saying, especially down by UGM. Uh, my office is actually right across the street, and we've seen a significant increase even in the parking garages. Um, and then to the question about uh, bringing homeless by creating services, I think a lot of the plan, all, a lot of the goals in the plan uh, revolve around coordinating services that already exist and also just making sure that we have the mechanisms <coughs> to help developers when they come in to build affordable housing and or housing in general. A lot of the housing facilities that are being built are actually mixed income type housing and not necessarily all for what we would call 30% AMI, which would essentially be the homeless population. There would be levels within that housing. And I think Mountain West Project is very similar to that because with tax credits, they're gonna have a varying number of units for various income levels. Let me just add one more thing too that I thought of and that is we talked about it from our very first meeting that housing first is really the philosophy behind the housing and urban development HUD. Uh, it has been for some time now, several years, I think since about 2011 is when they really came out and started focusing on that. And so the idea behind housing first is you know, the kind of the old idea was, you know, if you're homeless, we'll move you into a shelter, and then once we can get a room in a transitional home, we'll put you there, and then if kind of you prove yourself and get clean and sober and all of that, then we'll move you into a permanent house. And the housing first philosophy just jump starts and says we move you directly into permanent housing. And that's what they did in Salt Lake City, but they, you also have support in that permanent housing, much like the LEAD program, you have a navigator, you have a case manager, you have someone that comes in, and that's what permanent supportive housing really means, is a permanent home, but you're supported in the home. That's the vision. If we would have got the waiver that uh, the original new and improved waiver that the Oregon Health Authority was looking for, we would have had Medicaid dollars that could have funded that those navigators. Uh, and that support part, since we didn't, the dollars for Medicaid can't be used for housing more creatively, I guess. So 
in order to, if that's the vision, but in order to get there, we'd have to have resources to be able to hire those people to do that. So there's a lot we have to actually figure out and put in place before we can move people into permanent housing, but that would be the goal. It's so complicated. I hesitate to even say it, but I, I read a lot of stuff. Uh, the Hoovervilles they talked about during the Depression, I, that sounds like a horrible situation both for the people there and the people adjoining. And then even a comment this morning about as we look to increase densities in rural areas, uh, you know, outside of the cities, there's always impacts. And so we kind of have to factor all that in as we dive into this subject. Right. That's true. Anything else? Uh, very good. So again, thank you. Thank you both. And thank you. I'd like to say keep working, but I know you will. <laughs> All right. We'll move on in our meeting to the our consent calendar. I assume since you haven't been here forever, you're anxious to lead that. I've been here in my mind. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay, Mr. Chair, thank you. I will uh, move our consent calendar this morning. First item under Board of Commissioners, approve the restated inter intergovernmental agreement creating the Mid-Valley Behavioral Care Network, MVBCN. Under Business Services, approve the contract for services with Brown & Brown for $128,014 to provide insurance services for property, casualty, and employment benefits. Also under business services, approve a recommendation to adjust upward the pay grade for chief deputy medical examiner number 522 and redesignate classification for deputy medical examiner number 523. Also under business services, approve a recommendation to adopt the health department classifications for health program manager number uh, 168, health program supervisor number 169, Clinical Supervisor 1, number 170, Clinical Supervisor 2, number 171, Public Health Program Supervisor, number 173, Public Health Nurse Program Manager, number 175, and Adjust Upward Pay Grades for Health Administrator, number 535, and Department Division Director, number 538. Under community services, approve an order reappointing Susan Thompson and Mary Bunny McNett at, to the Oregon G Garden Foundation with terms ending January 31st, 2018 and January 31st, 2020, respectively. In the tax office, approve a property tax refund in the amount of $26,249.64 to Benjamin A. Bello, RTL. Also under the tax office, approve a property tax refund in the amount of $31,698.58 to the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Northwest. And I will second the motion, and I just have one comment before we vote. And that is on the Mid-Valley Behavioral Care Network restated intergovernmental agreement. So just wanted to highlight that this uh, restated agreement changes the composition of our board for the BCN and also our executive committee by adding a consumer representative and a provider representative to both the board and the executive committee. So we had a discussion about this uh, a little bit ago and we want to thank uh, John Latimer for his negotiating skills and uh, that uh, pleased that we are able to bring this forward now for um, our consideration. I might make one comment. I serve on the Oregon Garden Foundation board with Sue and uh, Bunny, and uh, they just work hard and care a lot, and I really appreciate them. So happy to see them get reappointed. Anything else? All right, I'll call the question confirming our consent calendar. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, we have three action items this morning. The first of them. Could have been under a presentation, but it's under community services, a presentation of the Oregon Garden Foundation's second quarter report, consider approval of the Oregon Garden Foundation's 2017 annual budget. Mark Hunter and Tamara Getsch are here. Tamara, you're leading. Yeah, good morning, commissioners. Uh, Tamara Getsch, Director of Community Services from Marion County. 
Uh, this morning we have both a, a brief presentation on the quarterly report for the Oregon Garden Foundation progress as well as um, before you for cons uh, approval consideration the annual budget for the Oregon Garden Foundation. Uh, the budget was brought to you um, a couple months back and uh, we've done some work since that time and Mark will talk about the specifics of that um, for your consideration today. Mark. Thank you, Tamara. And again, thank you for having me today, this morning. Um, in front of you is, is the quarterly report. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but there are a couple things I wanna point out. I think uh, one of the things that, that uh, good fundraisers do is to ensure that our expenses are being managed and in, in, um, uh, we've kind of revamped our direct mail and annual giving program uh, our direct mail program last holiday season last year cost us a little over five thousand dollars this year it cost us almost seven hundred and fifty dollars and we raised pretty much the same amount of money um, but uh, the reason for that is we took more of a direct targeted approach rather than a shotgun approach and I think um, we needed to do what we did last year just to learn about our donor base and, and to, to create quality donors moving forward so I'm pretty excited about that. I know it's a small win, but it's a great, it's a good win for the foundation as we move forward with all of our annual giving. So uh, in front of you is, a, uh, as I mentioned last time I was here, we are now able to compare same like quarters to quarters uh, now that I've been here for a little over a year, uh, actually a year and a half now. Um, so uh, I think progress is being made. I think with development, you, especially uh, when you bring in a new person, you really need to identify, uh, uh, you know, what we're raising money for and the need, uh, and then you have to identify what the story is. What what are we what are we telling our donors and, and what's important to them and figuring all that out. And I think we've made huge strides in doing that. Um, our story is your story kind of approach with all of our donors, with our members, and our volunteers. And it's really starting to show dividends, uh, I think, in, in the things that we're doing. To that end, um, I brought a copy of, of this annual report uh, that was handed out to you. Yesterday, we had an annual meeting celebrating 2016, uh, an opportunity to, to communicate and message to our donors, to our members, to our board members, to our, our community partners, um, the progress that we made in 2016. Um, I believe that 2017 has is, is been positioned to have just an extraordinary year as a foundation and do some of the things that we've all dreamed of, uh, that we've all put down in our strategic plan and the direction we're taking. So um, really, really pleased with the progress that the development program is making at the foundation. A lot of challenges ahead, a lot of opportunity ahead, and I think we're up to the task. Um, also in front of you, as Tamara mentioned, is a revised budget. Uh, the, the main uh, hold up on that, the main barrier that we were addressing in the delay of bringing it to this board at this time was uh, for the Oregon Garden Foundation to, uh, to find, and, and we interviewed three potential attorneys, and we were able to uh, find one that we think will do good for the Oregon Garden Foundation. Jill Foster with Churchill Leonard uh, Law Firm. Um, my understanding, she's already met with Gloria. I know I spent a couple of hours with her the other day and uh, she's fast tracking herself as much as possible to get on board. The great thing about that firm is they have a long history with the Oregon Garden uh, from the early days and they are willing to support us and help us in uh, some of our financial matters as well when it comes to attorney fees and those types of things, so we're excited about that. Um, but to that end, we added a line in the budget, the expenses of a professional fees for attorney of, of $10,000, and that $10,000, based on my conversation with Jill and the scope of work that we're looking at and their ability to support us with some pro bono work, uh, we feel is an adequate uh, amount uh, at this time. Um, and most of that to, to be dealt with earlier in the year than later in the year, just to get her up to speed and that kind of thing. Um, and with that, we've, uh, we show still a contingency balance of 
$8,000 for the fiscal year 2017, um, uh, which will become a contingency and a balance for us. So if you have any questions about that, I'd be, I'd be glad to try and answer those for you as best I can. I don't have any particular questions, but Tammy, I don't think we have documents that really have the budget. I have something from my own personal that may or may not be what we're considering here today. It's on the... Well, I couldn't find it there. You've got what you need. Okay, Well, you, it, you click above where it says community services. I did that. So there's two links there. One was for their... There were two documents board. submitted, okay. and they were merged the together in this presentation. I'll go out of it and start over. Yeah, so right, that one right above it. This one? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. That's what I was looking for. All I had was some performance measurements, but I thought, well, that isn't what we're doing. All right, so are there questions? And I do know from Mark Talk, the big change since what was presented earlier was the legal counsel that's been hired. Happened to meet her yesterday, and I think it would be a good choice. Um, so we'll go ahead. So where is that in the budget document? That's what I want to be able to see. And I was looking for it. would it. be on the second page under expenses. Right. So tell me where the line is. Line 20. It says professional uh, fees. Oh, there. It's professional fees attorney. Got it. All right. Perfect. That's what I was looking for. You made me happy. <laughs> is that enough? We think so. We, okay. It's a retainer. There's also some monies in their reserve. So in the event that the retainer and any pro bono services that uh, the firm is not going to be able to cover on their own, um, then we'll be able to take that question back to the foundation uh, for other resources available for those things. Then a, so, perhaps a motion. Sure. So, Mr. Chair, um, I would move that we approve the Oregon Garden Foundation's 2017 annual budget. And I'll second that motion. All right. So move and second to approve the Oregon Garden's 2017 annual budget. Further discussion? I hear none. So, all in favor say aye. 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 Now, before I let you go, Mark. Just uh, we held a the first, I believe, annual meeting uh, honoring volunteers and uh, outlining the garden. I think it was a very successful event and nicely attended, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank All right. you. Next item is under finance. We consider approval of the 2015-16 comprehensive annual financial report. And we have Cynthia Granitier, Jeff White, Marion County Finance Department, Ryan Pascarella from Grove, Mueller, and Swank, and perhaps others. Um, Cynthia, you want to start us out? We get these every year, so what does it tell us? Good morning, Commissioners. Um, I'm Cynthia Granitier, Chief Accountant with the Marion County Finance Department, and um, Jeff's letting me speak on behalf of the department. And this is Ryan Pascarella with Grove, Mueller & Swank, our audit firm. So our audit is complete for our financial statements for last fiscal year. And we have the comprehensive annual financial report for your approval. Uh, we received an um, unmodified audit opinion and uh, did not report any budget over expenditures at the legal compliance level. Um, did you have any other questions about the financial statements? No, they all look good, but I rely on you or John to tell me why it's important. So John, here's your opportunity to give me my annual refresher. Well, you've heard my story about the CAFR when I first came here. Uh, <clears throat> so I won't tell it again. <laughs> but if you look at the uh, MDNA in there, it, it really is important to tell you the state of the county finance, finances. And then I always look for any um, uh, notes to the financial statements because sometimes, they're, I've, as I found when I came here on that uh, CAFR that I looked at, there was this little thing for bonds that weren't explained. I found out they, they were Oregon Garden bonds that nobody was paying for. So, 
So I think the CAFR is a very important document and banks look at them and uh, other financial institutions look at them to make sure that we're doing fine and we are, that our finances are in very good shape. And uh, I could show you some of those things in there if you would like after we're done. Probably should. I think you already showed me some. <laughs> so can I just ask sure. a question? So. Um, is it the post-employment health care benefits that was the new thing that came up within the last? Well, what was new in fiscal year 2015 was the new pension reporting standards. Okay. And how is that going? I guess, you know, in terms of the, I think everyone was nervous because they thought it would impact the bottom line. And so now that you've had a couple of years experience doing that, how is, how is that going? Well, last fiscal year, we did uh, move from a pension asset to a pension liability. Um, that has two main causes. One is the impact of market losses on the assets of the PERS plan, and Marion County just has a proportionate share of all of that. Uh, and the other driver was the partial ruling against the legislative changes that were made to PERS um, to uh, put a cap on cost of living increases for PERS beneficiaries. Um, so the, for the fiscal year 2015, we showed a net pension asset, um, mostly due to that legislation. And then when the legislation was partially overturned, saying that um, the cap on the COLA could only be applied to benefits earned after the legislation was passed. Um, that basically added a significant amount to the pension liability that needs to be covered for PERS beneficiaries. And so the Marion County's proportionate share uh, went from an asset position to a net liability position. And that had a, a significant impact on our financial statements for last fiscal year. So to follow up, so does that affect our credit rating at all in terms of that, or is that kind of understood that everybody's kind of going through this and there's kind of a, so how does that work? That, I guess that's my question. I think that uh, it's something that our creditors would keep in mind. Um, you know, ratings agencies are the ones who set our bond ratings. Uh, I think that they would take a look at the county's overall financial health compared to that and the fact that we fully meet our required purse obligations every year. We meet our debt obligations. We're not struggling. Uh, so I think they kind of take all of those factors into account. Um, it's, it hasn't know. affected our credit. It hasn't no. downgraded our credit rating no. up to this point. No, it has not. Right. Okay. Mr. Chair. It does increase our liabilities on our on our financial statements, on which the, on the full accrual financial yeah, statements, on yes. The full, yeah, and uh, but it's doing that to every local government and the state of Oregon because we're required to put those liabilities on our financial statement. Um, what it means in the long run, because those liabilities could continue to grow uh, unless we find a way to reduce the overall debt for PERS. Uh, and our proportionate share, uh, I, it's difficult to see where that's going to happen, but who knows. Maybe, right. maybe this is a good time for a question then, because uh, I've been following this issue and the, uh, the increase is capped every year that, that PERS charges us as a government. Mm -hmm. Is that capped on the liability too, or is this a full liability? No. What, what's capped is the increase in our employer contribution rates. Right. Okay. The liability is always there. Okay. That, that actually has a tendency to drive up the PERS liability because They're employers aren't contributing right. enough to fully cover the liability based on the actuarial amortizations. And so the cap is helpful to employers as far as being able to manage our budget, but it doesn't really help the PERS liability situation. All right. Ryan, you wanted to be here today. Is there something you want to tell I, us? I did want to be here today, but clearly <laughs> Cynthia, excuse me, Cynthia did a good job of explaining how the audit went related to the 
uh, CAFR, and we did give it an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion. We did also provide one other document to you. It's a two-page letter. It's called a governance letter, and what that is is a communication directly from my auditing firm to the commissioners. Just gives a real quick overview of how the audit went. If we had any difficulties in completing the audit, which we did not, I will say, if you read this letter, it's a very clean audit that happened. And I just want to really thank Cynthia and Jeff and the finance departments for their level of detail that they do in their jobs. And when we come in, we're here for about three weeks every year uh, looking at your financial processes and just auditing the year in numbers. Uh, we get in here and your numbers are, you know, pretty much clean as can be because they have gone through everything the entire year to make sure that the numbers are accurate. So I want to thank them for that. And thanks for reminding us that. I know they yeah. do a great job. Mr. Chair, I think it's really important <clears throat> to uh, talk about our finance department, our CFO, uh, Jeff White, and our chief accountant, Cindy. Uh, Cynthia Granatier, they do a great job, and uh, you know, for for me, who is sort of accountable for our finances in the county, it's really <laughs> important that we have those kinds of staff that pay very close attention to our finances. And uh, I'm proud of the work they do, and they make my job a lot easier. Ditto. All right. Do we have a motion for approval then? Mr. Chair, I'll move that we approve the 2015-16 uh, Comprehensive <clears throat> Annual Financial Report. Second. All right. Move and second to approve the 2015-16 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Any further discussion? Don't hear or see any, so all in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Again, thanks for all your efforts. Nice work. Thank you. Keep it up. Now I'll open a contract review board under business services, we consider approval of a special procurement for the Oregon Lock and Access, for Oregon Lock and Access for 150,000 to provide medical, keyway access and security controls for the county facilities. Now, before we get started, my little claim to fame is I can get into almost any county facility. Is this designed against me? Let's just get to the bottom of it. <laughs> I might have to change that. All right. Uh, commissioners, we have before you today a uh, request to authorize a board order which uh, approves a special procurement for uh, Oregon Lock for the period of the, uh, January 1st, 2017 through uh, June 30th of 2020 uh, with a not to exceed value of $150,000. Uh, the special procurement is authorized uh, by Oregon Revised Statute and the Marion County Public Contracting Rules. Uh, we did a public notice uh, through ORPIN with a findings for exemption, which I believe you have attached to your agenda. And uh, we received no public uh, comment or protests in response to that public notice. Um, so I will let Colleen discuss a little bit what the uh, ins and outs of the, of the services are. So having had to deal with this over the last 25 years in my career, it's a, this is a proprietary system that most regional dealers deal with from a Medco kind of system. So we have a keyway that's specific just to Marion County. What makes that unique is that our keys are stamped with Oregon lock and key on them. When that's stamped, the uh, Dealer here, Oregon Lock and Key, has our proprietary keyway that no one can purchase unless they go outside the Medco organization, come back in as a distributor and purchase that keyway from Oregon Medical and Lock. So that's the kind of proprietary system that's unique to Marion County. Most other counties, uh, entities, or agencies are going to have the same type of proprietary keyway. That's what ours, we've had that keyway for 32 years here at Marion County. So, um, and we've been with War Oregon Lock for over 17 years. The unauthorized key duplication is a, is a major role in compromising many security systems, and that's why we have Oregon Lock and Key locked down. We have a system in place, an internal process as to who can go get those keys, who, who has access to work with Oregon Lock and Key. So that's why we're asking you here to 
uh, allow us to, to contract with them so we can continue that relationship, but also enhance in se our security countywide. I understand this is a special process, but uh, the underlying issue is um, uh, unauthorized keys, perhaps, or we're making any changes in, in actual uh, physical? We are, we're doing some changes, and uh, we're actually looking at rekeying a couple facilities. So I know that we're looking at rekeying public works, for example. We just actually did some rekeying of the health building uh, as we just finished that project. So new projects coming on board will have their own key systems as well. <laughs> along with uh, your badge. So we'll have your security badge, but we do have some keys. And as we start rolling out more of the access badges, some of the keys may eventually go away, but some of those keys we have to keep for, for some systems that we keep under key as opposed to an access card. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. We have had a problem with people losing keys or leaving county employment and taking keys with them. We're trying to get away from those hard keys as best we can uh, because they, if, if people lose them or somebody gets a hold of them, they really present a, a problem for us in terms of security for our facilities. Uh, another thing we're trying to do is set up using the key cards, having a special box for folks to go to to get a key card to get in. Uh, rather than having all these hard keys out. So uh, it's a continuing process we're going through to try and improve our security. It seems like you ought to kind of change every few years anyway, to be honest, but that's not quite what you're calling for. We, we do the audits. That's part of our internal process is auditing. So we have staff who are going out to departments now, auditing with departments what keys are there putting some other processes in place, for example, when evaluations occur that we want to validate the keys that people have, why they have them. So we're having them look at why they have certain accesses. Do they still need those access? So an example is if I move from one department to another, do I need the same access I had at that department? That's what's being revisited. And I have staff going out, even today, going out doing that. Great. All right. So we are under the Contract Review Board hat, right? Mm -hmm. sure. and so as the Contract Review Board, I would move that uh, we approve the special procurement for Oregon Lock and Access for $150,000 to provide, and how do you pronounce it again, Medco? Medco. Medco, keyway access and security controls for county facilities. And I'll second the motion. All right, so we're moving and seconded to approve the special procurement for Oregon Lock and Access. Any further discussion? Here none, all in favor say aye. 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 The motion passes. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And don't keep me out of anything. You don't know. Maybe I have a legitimate need. Y you may. Thank you. All right. It's now well past 930. We have a public hearing. It's a final item this morning. It's under public works. It's a hearing to consider a zone change comprehensive plan. Uh, zone ZCCP case number 16001 Gray. Clerk's file number 5718, and Joe Fenimore is here to lead that discussion. Um, good morning, commissioners. Excuse me, I'll open that oh. hearing, and we'll follow our normal procedure. Staff will uh, give a report, then the applicant can uh, have his opportunity to talk. Anybody from the public is, that is signed up, I don't know that they have or not, and then a final return to our staff for questions. So with that, Joe, if you'd begin. Uh, for the record, Joe Fenimore, Public Works. Um, the item before you today is an application to change the zone from special agriculture to AR-10 and to change the comprehensive plan designation from special agriculture to rural residential on a five-acre parcel located at 3464 Ridgeway Drive, Southeast Turner. The property is located on the south side of Ridgeway Drive, about a mile west of its intersection with Parish Gap Road. The property was legally, legally created as Lot 7 of the Mark IV Village Subdivision in 1972. Surrounding properties are zoned SA and consist of small lots, many of which contain dwellings. The hearings officer held a public hearing on this application on April 13, 2016, and on October 24th issued a recommendation that the board deny the request. The property is a subject of planning goal, statewide planning goal 3, agricultural lands, in order for the request to be approved, the applicant must justify an exception to this goal. 
There are three types of, of exceptions to this statewide planning goal. The first is based on the concept that the property is too physically developed to be available for resource use. The second is based on the concept that the land surrounding the property is developed to such an extent that the property itself is irrevocably committed to uses other than a resource use. <clears throat> the third requires the county to show other reasons why a goal exception is appropriate. In this case, the applicant proposed both a physically developed and a committed exception for the board to consider. In summary, the hearings officer found that the physically developed exception to the statewide goal three is not recommended. However, if the applicant provides additional satisfactory information on soil type, woodland suitability, as well as additional information on why the property cannot be put in farm use, the hearings officer recommends the board take an irrevocably committed exception to statewide planning goal three and grant the competency plan amendment to rural residential and a zone change to AR-10. <clears throat> if the goal exception is approved, the proposal will meet all the competency plan policies and zone change criteria. The applicant has submitted additional information for the board to consider that is in your packet, and I will let him present that shortly. Um, the board has the options of continuing the public hearing, close the hearing and leave the record open, close the hearing and approve, modify or deny the request, or remand the matter back to the hearings officer. I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you have at this time. All right, any questions? <clears throat> yeah, I think um, just to kind of lay out the parameters, so we're looking for a goal three exception, is Correct. that Correct. Right? And then goal 14 is connected to that as usual. Right? Goal 14 is, except in this case, the applicant is proposing an AR-10 zone. Okay, so, so then the goal so 14 is goal not. Goal 14 goes away because right. of that, correct. And so for the goal three exception, I was reading the file last night, so my understanding is that they're asking on two bases, which would be a- Phys Physically developed. Physically developed and then irre irrevocably committed, right? Correct. And the physically developed, it relies on the Nagley decision, and it was very clear to me that the hearings officer was not excited about that. So if we just, if, if we, if the board agrees with the hearings officer on that particular rationale, then for the uh, irrevocably, irrevocably committed, I can't talk today, uh, there's the soil information that had that, that the soil information was related to that particular reason is that correct that is correct and yes. so you're trying to say that really not possible to farm it's committed to other purposes that those types of arguments right. is because that of what's going on it, itself in relation to the other properties around it right and there was one other thing that she asked for them to bring forward i thought what was that that was that was once again there's a whole bunch of things that are considered farm use. And uh -huh. you can't talk about every single one, but she thought that they needed some more information on, on, on why it can't, why be, it can't be put in right. some type of farm use. Right. And so then I guess the last question that I have before, and because I'm just kind of going through what I'm hoping that I hear, uh, is that if those mm -hmm. things are brought forward, are you as planning staff uh, do you feel like you have the level of expertise needed to be able to say this evidence fulfills that, or would you suggest that we need to send it back to the hearings officer for her review again? I believe that planning staff could make that. Okay, so once we hear more about soil and more about farming, you could come back and we could ask you, and that is you could say that's sufficient to meet the evidence requirement. Yes. So and is it really just limited to those that that area? I think it is because the hearings officer. I mean the the. The analysis of that particular goal exception starts on like page seven and ends on page 20. So she did a very thorough analysis right. and came up with those two little things that need to be Correct. For, further looked at. So, All yes. Right. All right. And then one more thing. So, the platting issue really is connected more with the Negley decision in that first area, right? So, the fact, I mean, there were a lot of old documents about from the 1970s and 80s about who owned it. And it was interesting. It reminded me of Measure 37 cases because. The, the land use laws came into effect and then things changed and all of that. To what extent does that old documentation relate to the information we're gonna be looking at here today? I think it's just one of the elements that shows that it's part of a small, of a, of a previously, you know, it was intended originally. Subdivision, right? Yeah, of a, of a subdivision, and that's one of the factors that could be considered. Okay, but is it considered in an uh, irrevocably committed context? I, I think it can be considered in, either, in both contexts. In either. Yes. Okay, all right. That's Thanks. That's useful. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Joe. 
All right, we have two people that have signed up uh, to speak. Uh, the applicant, Richard Gray, and his attorney, Wally Lean, who's speaking of Measure 37. We got to be, I think we could say friends, Wally. We've missed you. Right. We were here about every week. You were. <laughs> Like Trial by fire learning land use, I'll tell you, that was quite the experience. If you would introduce yourself and, and then go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Commissioners. My name is Wally Lean. I'm land use lawyer. I practice lot 693 Chemeketa Street, Northeast Salem, 97301. I have with me today Richard Gray, the applicant, who will be available to answer any questions that, that I might not be able to answer. Um, Picking up on a couple of the things that, that Joe referred to, I, I think the key element for the Negley decision was the fact that the platting occurred even before we had statewide goals and guidelines. So it was before statewide goals and gu guidelines, before zoning, before the Marion County Comprehensive Plan. And so in the Negley decision, the the pronouncement, if you will, the adoption of this board was that the commitment to this property being non-resource, that is really focusing on the physically developed side, um, that it was the platting before the land use system came into fruition that committed it to non-resource use. So regardless of some of the more traditional, physically developed issues that might occur, like you know, you've got an acre of um, pit run rock for a log deck, and you have three big chicken buildings or something that have physically developed the property. In this case, that there are some development on the property. There's a shop, and there's uh, an access way, and there's a well, and a few things like that. There's some perimeter trees, but the key, under Negley, and the reason that we pursued the Negley side of this equation, because there's really two ways to do it, was because of the platting. And our feeling was that your decision in Negley basically said, if you have a subdivision that was platted prior to the land use system, that subdivision is, is, is physically developed to uses for rural residential and not for resource use. Now, I will say this, that while we have pursued that, we don't care. Bottom line is whether you go with the physically developed, the Nagley decision, or whether you follow the, the hearings officer's approach to address this under irrevocably committed, Richard needs a house. He's got a lot that he paid <laughs> as if he could get a house. Uh, it's a 19-lot subdivision, and there are houses on, I think, 16 of the other lots, and one of the houses has combined two lots together. So really, it's the 19 becomes 18 because two lots have been combined into one. So basically, this is the last lot in this subdivision that doesn't have a house. And in fact, this property was received approval <laughs> to get a house. Uh, I think it was 1981, the prior owner went in and got the approval and let it lapse. Uh, I think there was an extension, maybe two extensions, and a couple of years before Richard bought the property that that lapsed. Unbeknownst to Richard and not disclosed to Richard, which are a whole bunch of other issues, but um, he purchased the property. I, I mean, if you, drive, if you drive out there, here's a rural subdivision. They're five-acre lots primarily, and you drive down Ridgeway or the, the back side, you know, it looks like a subdivision. You would naturally think that this was entitled to have a house. Well, when he got ready to build the house, he learned that that wasn't necessarily the case. So moving forward, one other thing, well, I, I guess a couple of things. The, the AR-10, as Joe pointed out, is the key to eliminating the application of Goal 14. But there's another side element to that. Because this is a five-acre property and we're applying a 10-acre zone, it ensures that you will never have to deal with redivision of this property. And that was something that, that was a, a key concern early on 
is we don't want to change zoning that will allow proliferation of partitions and other things. So the AR-10 uh, does has two functions. It complies us with goal 14 and it prevents any future redivision. The other thing that I want to point out is that this case has been pending almost a year and we've gone through extensive public hearings and open record periods, notices out to the neighbors, and we've never once had anybody appear at a public hearing or write a letter or anything in opposition to this application. I think everybody out there raises their eyebrows and, and puts their hands to the sky and says, you can't get a house out there, why, why not? So it, it's not something that's a big concern to anybody in the neighborhood except to Richard who can't get the building permit, which is why we're here today. Looking at the, the additional information that um, the hearings officer asked for, um, the key for the non-resource level of use of this property is the lack of water. It's five acres, everybody knows you can't do much with five acres, but the hearings officer said we need to dig a little bit deeper and find out if there's any specialty crops that can be used. And so what we did uh, in our supplemental memo that we, we provided you with some soil information which she asked for, the key of the soil information is it shows a clay la layer that's not too far underneath the topsoil, and that clay layer is a part of the problem with water not being able to infiltrate down to roots of plants. That is identified as Exhibit S. Um, and then we put in a, uh, a pretty extensive brochure that uh, we obtained from uh, OSU Extension Service uh, called Small Farming and Selecting an Enterprise for Small Acreages. And we looked at all of these, and, and every one of them that focuses on small crops like garlic, uh, herbs, and those things are all very high consumers of water. They need irrigation. And there is no water. This property is in a sensitive groundwater overlay zone, an SGO. Uh, he has a... Um, uh, adequately performing well for domestic purposes but not for irrigation purposes and there really is no ability to put another another well in so when the hearings officer looked at this and said you know talk to us about more intensive fine-tuned farming Richard did that he went out and went to OSU and and dug around and we found these brochures to talk about strawberries and garlic and marigolds and everything else and the bottom line is there isn't a way to adequately farm that given the resources that are available on his property. So we think that we have addressed that, that particular issue uh, with both the soil information, the SGO lack of water, and the detailed information on the kinds of small uh, acreage crops that can be, um, can be produced on small farms. Um, so we think that We've answered the questions that the hearings officer put forward. And, and if we want to focus on the irrevocably committed, as Joe pointed out, the, the idea is that you look at the impacts on the subject property from the surrounding property. So in physically developed, you're looking at the site itself. In irrevocably committed, you don't look so much at the site, but you look at everything around and what has it done. Well, if you look at the maps, and we have produced three or four different maps of areas, we've provided um, a very detailed inventory of the properties uh, and the packets of information that go along with it. Um, you know, it's uh, 100 pages probably of different material. And you'll find, especially in Exhibit O, we did a table of all of the properties that were within a couple of miles. Uh, and the average parcel size was uh, 7.5 acres. Uh, they were, there were 15 parcels over 5 acres, 5 were under 5 acres, and 17 were in the 5, almost right on 5-acre parcel. Um, the largest parcel was 40 acres, and the smallest parcel was 0.31 acres. 
uh, only three of the parcels in the study area did not have a non-farm dwelling. So now if you take a look, this property sits sort of at the western edge of a 19 lot subdivision and then it's got developed non-resource uh, properties to the north, to the east, to the south, and to the, to the west. So all of those impacts uh, are, the, are such that this property with its non-ability to do resource is really committed because, irrevocably committed, because of the properties that lie around it. So we believe that under Negley we've met the physically developed standard but more importantly, using the hearings officer's uh, analysis that we have met the irrevocably committed basis uh, primarily because of the location that it's in and all the small r residential parcels around it, but more importantly because there isn't enough water to do even a small farm intensive project. So we would be more than happy to answer any questions that we would ask that you approve this zoning so that Richard can build himself a house questions so just let me ask uh, so the information that you referred to on the soils was this submitted then in that larger packet after the hearings officer reviewed the information so there were a couple packets in the file one was a very large packet for the hearings officer and then there was a subsequent one so I just want to make sure what you read on the record wasn't something the hearing officer already saw and said that wasn't enough all right there are two exhibits that relate to soil. One went with the original right. application, which she saw and right. said, you know, I'd like to have a little bit more. Right, exactly. And that is uh, exhibit. Um, yeah, that's okay. I saw that yeah. when I was going and, through the and file. And then when we got her report. Then you had this, the additional information. Right. So what you just read to us was additional information. I just that's wanted right. to confirm that. Yeah, right. and that is identified as exhibit S. Okay. In the supplemental materials. Okay. Thank you. Well, oh, do you excuse me? No. Well, I just have one, and it's just so I just to know. So the one I th think of right away would be like Christmas trees, and irrespective of whether it makes a profit or not, and without having been out there, it seems like you could do that. Just did your information say what would preclude that type of operation? Um. There was, I think, in the, the, the OSU material that we got didn't really focus on Christmas trees because it was looking at small acreages, five acres and below. And I think OSU takes, takes the approach that it takes about 20 acres okay. for Christmas trees. And so because the study that we put out um, as um, Exhibit U really focused on that small, they, they, they looked at herbs and garlic and vegetables, that sort of thing as being the kind of cropping that you would use on a small five acre or less. I accept it's too small and I knew <clears throat> it's too small to be a real, probably couldn't even pay the taxes with it, but if you're just looking for one crop, it didn't take much water, in that kind of environment, I thought of that, and I just wanted yeah. to address it. Anything else? All right, anything else that you'd like to Nothing say? Nothing from our side, right. thank you. Thank you. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Richard? Uh, no, not really. I think we've covered everything as thoroughly as we could. Um, we've looked at everything. All right. Thank you much. Thank All right, you. Joe, if you would come back then. So Joe, while you're getting there, I guess I'd like to hear, and I'll let others ask questions, that, that now we've met the criteria that was, or, or met or not met, I should say, that was uh, suggested to be needed that uh, that this could be approved or disapproved and defended, whatever comes up. So could you just kind of comment on what you've heard, I um, guess what I'm asking? I reviewed the criteria and the arguments, and I believe that it that it probably satisfies the requirement for the, for the uh, the irrevocably committed goal exception. I don't like the word probably. It either does or it <laughs> I think it does. Yes. All right, thank you. <laughs> and, it could, and, it, and I believe it could be defended also. Okay. And I just wanted to make a comment, if I could, on that. 
And I can appreciate it. And when I read through the file, I was struck by the difficulties in terms of, well, you know, you had this lapsed permission and then you weren't notified of that. And, and I know uh, that we were, the testimony said that that's a different issue and, and you're dealing with that differently. Uh, and uh, so that's really unfortunate. And Oregon has very, very strict land use laws when it comes to exclusive farm use and whether houses can go on it. It's been, you know, kind of an ongoing discussion, I guess, <laughs> between counties and the state and, and how that works. Uh, you know, the overarching goal is to preserve farmland, and I entirely support that. We have a wonderful agriculture industry in Marion County, and we don't want to subdivide all of our farmland. Um, so I can appreciate the difficulties there and purchasing a home, I mean, purchasing a lot with the expectation of buying a home and paying for it what you would buy for, what you would pay for a lot if you were going to buy a home, not if you were going to have a farm. At the same time, all of that really is not relevant to our discussion today, and I just want to make sure that we don't use any of that as the basis upon which we're making this decision today. We cannot say, well, because that was an unfortunate situation, uh, that then we're going to allow a home because this gentleman needs to have a home because he was uh, not given appropriate information. So. While that was something that was set on the record, I just want to make sure that, that, that I'm clear on the record that while I was sympathetic to that, my decision today is not influenced by that at all. It's influenced solely on the evidence that's being brought forward to say whether or not this meets the criteria that the state has put forward to say whether you can take an exception to goal three. And there were, and our hearings officer did, as you mentioned, uh, an exhaustive review. I mean, it was very lengthy, very detailed, looked at every element, every goal, every code uh, that was relevant to that, and said there are two areas where additional information needs to be brought forward. And we identified what those areas were at the outset. And so now we've had the testimony on those two elements, and our planning staff is saying that that's sufficient to meet that. So I just I want to make sure that that's really clear because uh, we can mix things up and, and be sympathetic, but in the end, as Commissioner Brentano said, our decisions here have to be defensible. If someone were to come forward and take this to, a, uh, what would it be, LUBA? Would it be, yeah, a Land Use Board of Appeals, we need to clearly say that we looked at the evidence on the record and only that evidence and made our decision based on that evidence. And so I appreciate your uh, comments, Joe, about saying that what we heard here today satisfied that. Um, so, anyway, that's my comment. Glad you clarified that. All right. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> Looking for a motion? Um, just one more, because maybe before you make that motion, just a, it's a little strange. Maybe it's not strange. It happens. I don't notice. But the hearings officer, well, we had a recommended we deny. Um, so I'd like you, Joe, to say that your feeling is to approve this, uh, and then what would be the procedure? following you make up an order where what, what happens again just remind me <clears throat> you would approve it approve the request we will bring it back as an ordinance as an ordinance. So it'll be an administrative ordinance well we will schedule it for adoption and then adopt it the following week when, when it's prepared the all findings right. will be prepared in the so all we have to do at this point is approve this correct all right thank you so mr. chair I'll move that we close the public hearing and consider the um, zone chains comprehensive plan uh, Z six ZCCP case number one six or uh, one six, yeah. I but instead of consider you mean to approve it. I think yeah. I heard excuse that. me. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll move to close the public hearing and approve the zone change comprehensive plan ZCCP case number sixteen. I just can't resist. We tried to make you perfect in your previous year. But, <laughs> but I'm never going to be. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll, yeah, a, a lot of forgetting must have happened over the oh, last few oh, years. Wait, I, did, I didn't even read the whole thing. I, I'll, re, I'll remove that motion and I'll restate the motion, Mr. Chair. Third time may be perfect. Mr. Chair, I'll move that we close the public hearing, approve a zone change, comprehensive plan, Z C. CP case number 16-001 
Gray Clerk's File Number 5718. I will second the motion. Oh, All right, it's good. been moved and seconded to approve this zone change. Uh, any further discussion? And hearing now, I'll call a question. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Motion passes, and thanks for all your work on this. See you and good luck to you. I hope it all goes well. All right, that's the last of our items, except to read the places we'll be together in the coming week. Um, oh, this is getting closer. At noon today, we have, I think some of us will be at, is the State of the City Salem Address, the Salem Convention Center, 200 Commercial Street, Southeast in Salem. And then we'll meet tomorrow morning with representatives from the city of Salem at 8 o'clock till 9 at the uh, Sassy Onion, 1244 State Street, again, Salem. Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30, Just, Justice Reinvestment Summit, Salem Convention Center, 200 Commercial Street, Southeast Salem. And that's follow the same Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, another Justice Reinvestment Summit, Salem Convention Center, 8.30 to 4.30. Monday, it's time for this, closed in observance of President's Day, so there won't be any, well, there could be, but I don't know of any times we'll be together. Tuesday, 8.30 to 10, a work session, review of economic development programs and budget, Silverton Conference Room, fifth floor, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. Tuesday, the 21st, 10 o'clock to 11. Executive session for bargaining pursuant to RS 192660D, 2D, in Sovereign Conference Room, 5th floor, 555 Court Street. Tuesday, an event that's rather interesting, 11:15 uh, to 1245 Salem Leadership Government Day in this, here in this room, the Senator Hearing Room, 1st floor, 555 Court Street, Salem. That's followed at 1:15 to 2:15 on Tuesday with a one-on-one. -on -one with department head Faye Fagel from the Juvenile Department, Sovereign Conference Room, fifth floor, 555 Court Street, Northeast in Salem. I just might slip in here. We try to meet annually prior to budget with each of our department heads, and this is the first for this year. Next Wednesday, nine o'clock is our next board session. And following that, I'm not quite sure on how this is supposed to work yet, whether even we're supposed to be there, I don't remember. So we'll be getting to the bottom, but we haven't, uh, Schedule as if some or all of us may be there. It's 1.30 to 5 o'clock. It's a joint Marion County, Clackamas County. Oh, this one we will be yeah. at. Clackamas County Commission to appoint the House District 18 representative, Mount Angel Fire District 300 Monroe Street, Mount Angel. So, Gloria, if I could catch you, I believe there's a PCP uh, uh, selection Saturday. I'm not sure time or place. Are we supposed to go to that? Can we go to that? What's the rule? Uh, I believe that you're talking about the uh, Republican, uh, the PCP, right, spell that out for folks. I think maybe all of us are PCPs. Or well, the, it has to be from that district. Right. Is that in like, your district? We would be able to observe. We would be able to observe. Correct. I knew there was something. You can attend. Right. It's open to any of the no, it isn't where I live. Right. Republican members. I'm too. in Jody Hack's district. And it used to be like what? Likewise. Used to be Kevin Cameron's district. The, the question is, Gloria, are we able to go there and observe as um, the public, commissioners, right. as commissioners, because we can listen to these potential candidates, of which three to five may be sent in front of us um, on the other event. If the recommendation, if you, if one or more of the commissioners, if one commissioner were to go, it would be to observe, uh, but not necessarily to participate because you will be um, discussing the candidates and uh, um, at the joint meeting. Uh, that if more than one commissioner were going to attend, you might want to notice that. Well, that's what I was going to suggest that we do, so I'll see that that's done. I'm not sure that I'm going or if it's right to go or what, but... Uh, well, if you're, a, if you're a PCP from that district, I are you? I am not. You're no, not no. from that district. Right. Oh, okay. No, yeah. just, Neither one of us are right. from that yeah. district. Because when I was We're, from the district, when Denise got appointed, I actually participated because right. I'm an elected PCP and that's my obligation. Likewise. I wear two hats, so... But I'm trying to think... 
so I don't see if, if you can participate there I don't see why it would be a conflict anywhere else right yeah. a conflict but if I right. think we might be and maybe just to be safe we ought to have it as a notice yeah. note I'm not planning to go I'll just let you know that. the only reason I'm uh, the reason I'm going is because uh, <laughs> former representative Gilliam asked me to read his statement uh, okay um, to the group that's there so I don't even I haven't even seen it yet but that's where I'd be going and I, I'm not planning that. on going but I would like to see a copy of that statement or sometime it, it'll be pretty good I'm sure all right so we've got through our schedule anything else you'd like to talk to you, you want to talk about well Fish, let's talk fishing yeah, no talk. no <laughs> legitimate <laughs> because you've just been in another country and you look at their systems uh, I, I thought of this truly Janet uh, Homeless, it'd be one thing to be homeless in Belize under a palm tree, then didn't see any, just didn't see it. No, there's homeless uh, people in Hawaii. So um, uh, I'm sure if you look at some of the living conditions, people here would consider that that's almost some of it's homeless. homeless. I mean, some of them live with you know a 10, 10 roof, um, uh, you know, very few of them have air conditioning and it's 80 degrees plus all the time. Um, people. You know, you, you would see people working, standing in the water, actually shoveling sand waist deep to dig out to dredge a uh, place maybe uh, for a, where they're trying to build a seawall or whatever. Everybody works. Uh, everybody was extremely friendly. They count. On the mainland, they have more crime, but uh, they, they obviously depend on tourism. So they take care of they it. Take, they take, they uh, are very friendly. It's, ob it's the um, old British Honduras, uh, so English speaking. Uh, it's tied to the American dollar. Um, so it's, it's a very positive experience, but everybody works there. Um, and, it, you know, it's not unusual to see people riding their bikes to work everywhere they go and working long hours. And, and um, so it's a very. So you've kind of. I was interested. You kind of got a public safety, but public safety health. Anything. I had to go to the that, police station oh, while good. I was there. It was what pretty happened? interesting. I didn't get in trouble, so I just want to clarify that anybody who's there's, you know there's no drunken bike riding. There newspapers or across the street wanting to write another article or something. Really. Uh, the first night we were there, we had two writ. Uh, we had um, rented two golf carts, and uh, we were coming back for, from town and stop at this place called the truck stop that has several. It's really neat. They've taken these uh, cargo containers and made them into little restaurants. Uh, and we stopped there to get something to eat. And uh, we took off, Judy and I did, and, and another couple that was with Raquel and her husband were with us. And we took off, got back to our condo, and we get a text message from the other group saying somebody stole our golf cart. So I ended up in the police station, because I'm the experienced one down there, trying to get a police report filed out. It was pretty amazing. And uh, talk about sobering stations. Right behind where I was doing this police report was just, that's what it was, just a kind of a cell where they had some guy in there yelling and screaming. And the, the policeman apologized because he says he's from Guatemala. He's not even from here, OK? But I know where the police station is oh, there. Yeah, yeah. That worries me. So I, that wasn't quite clear, did they? You did have a golf cart stolen and yeah, they was it recovered then? Or? Yeah, yeah, they found it. And what was interesting is you lock your golf carts there. You lock this, this part of the steering wheel because, you know, every club cart starts with the same yeah. key. And uh, the people that we had rented it from, they contacted them right away. They went to where uh, it was stolen from. Well, there was one golf cart there. The place had closed down, and they recognized where that golf cart, uh, where those people rent those golf carts from, and it's at another resort. Oh. They drove up to the other resort and found our golf cart. So they took the wrong one? Yeah. Sort of? Yeah. yeah. That's exactly yeah. what happened. I'll tell you the story later. It's <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, it uh, reminds me when I was in France, I, we, had, I had, uh, we had a car broken into and camera stolen and stuff. And so we ended up filing a police report at midnight, and I had to do it in French. And I hadn't taught French since 88, 89. And, but it came back really well. I was so excited to be able to speak French almost made up for the fact that I lost all my pictures off the top of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> well, they, they speak English, but the guy's typing like this <laughs> and back and he's got this monitor that's, you know, like this. It's quite the, 
facility. I had two years of French, and I don't think I could even remember what stolen is. Uh, and get it through. I will say, in in uh, being back this morning, I went to the economic uh, presentation that uh, Kurt Arthur's group does mm -hmm. at seven o'clock this morning, and I got to sit through two of the presentations. One was. Um, from uh, George Gravenhorst uh, on the agricultural real estate business. In really interesting numbers to see the appreciation of farm property and what's happened in the last two to three years in Marion County and the Willamette it's Valley. It's not all marijuana driven, I hope. Well, part of it, he did mention that, but but it's a lot of uh, uh, wine, the wineries are, mm -hmm. California wineries are coming up. A lot of um, the hazelnut uh, crop is driving the price up uh, of, of property, and then the other presentation before I had to leave was from Chad at Sedcor uh, about the he had these graphs showed the, the vacancy rate and where we're at today. We're we're below two percent in vacancy rate, and anything in in fact we're below Portland on industrial property, and anything below ten percent is considered pretty healthy. And then he went through all the projects that are under construction right now. We, we're in a um, industrial boom mm -hmm. relative to uh, the size of our industrial property right now. It's pretty that's amazing great. what's going on, the construction uh, that's happening. So that was a really positive thing to come back and hear that good news. And I know that the three of us are, are um, supportive of some of those things and uh, what's going on in our, our economy. So good, good to be able to see that. All right, anything else? Yes, today is my mother's 93rd birthday. Oh, wonderful. So say happy birthday, Mom. We want you to sing to her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> yeah, I will. By the way, you, you, the both of you did really well while I was gone, too. How do you know that? Because I, I didn't watch a no, thing. No, I knew you oh. did. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, kept on, on, I kept up on emails. That was about it. <laughs> All right. I was going to say, if you were watching us, that would have been very interesting. Do the quick math. 1930, uh, 93 is born what year? What's that? What year is she born to be 94? 24. 24. Wow. So she's seen a lot of things then too, hasn't she? Yeah. Well, actually, she w moved to Salem and lived in West Salem and uh, during the war and walked across the West Salem Bridge, and she was the assistant manager in the Elsinore Theater, and she has stories about how she used to have to knock on the bathroom doors and kick the sailors out of the Elsinore Theater in, in the evening and walk with the policemen down to the bank to deliver the money and oh, all of dear. those things. So she's got a really long history in Salem, some really great stories. Mm. So that would be in the 40s? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. All right, anything else this morning? Then I thank you all. We'll call this meeting adjourned.